What's up, Wizards? It's Dev from SPMTG. We like it a magic. And did you know that Standard still exists? That's right. It's still out there kicking around, doing its gosh darn best. God bless the little guy. But here's the problem. Did you know there's still six more weeks until we get to play with new cards in Standard? That's not so great, especially around this time when things start feeling a little sloggish. I mean, by now, you probably know what the best decks in Standard are. You played either against or even with them. I'm not going to judge dozens or even hundreds of times. Up to this point, it feels a little bit samey, by the way, in case you don't know what the best decks in Standard are. A little bit more on that after the break, but that won't be our primary focus today. You know, Instead of doing the boring old Standard deck tier list that a lot of people do around this time, we're going to go a little bit off the beaten path in this video. And instead, we're going to talk about the decks no one is talking about. Today, we're going to tier list the off-meta decks in Standard. And I'm your favorite magic channel, favorite magic channel. Best believe that the professor go bananas for my deck tech. And we're back like in submersible hot topic two months ago. You guys remember that? Anyway, let's not focus on yesterday. Let's move into today. And in fact, the future. Because we have an awful lot to talk about in this one. Not only am I going to list all them off meta decks like we were talking about in the intro, but I also dropped a breadcrumb back there that I really ought to follow home at this point. In case you don't know what the best decks are in standard, there's some data out there what we can help with to determine what them decks are. So if you actually wanted like a standard tier list as part of this video, I can give that to you. It looks a little bit like this. In the S tier, you got Esper Midrange, and that's a number of decks from Esper Schooner that just plays a lot of really good cards to like Esper Legends, basically anything Esper is really high tier right now. You also have Azo Schooner, so you can just drop the black and not play Rafine and still have an S tier deck with just Azorius mid range cards because Schooner is that good and all the other cards that are built around it. In the A tier, you've got decks like Golgari, just about the only real mid range deck that doesn't play counter spells that can hang right now. But you got Mono Red and Soldiers as the two best aggro decks, pure aggro decks in the environment right now. In the B tier, you've got a deck that would have been A tier last season or perhaps perhaps even S tier, it's a Traxo ramp, but some of the decks have gotten either too fast or too counterspelly for it to deal with, but it still hangs on in the format. Aside from that, you've got really good aggro decks like Humans and Boros Convoke that put up results, but not quite as many results as the other aggro decks in the format. Down here in the C tier, you have decks that are very much still alive, but don't put up the results they used to, like Mono White, Azorius Control, and Demir Midrange, which is actually a relatively new deck that just replaced a sort of Demir Control slash mid-range list that people were playing, but now that we have Tishana's Tidebinder along with Urtai Resurrected and such, this can still play like a tempo-oriented game, but play some mid-rangey cards as well, so it's kind of hard to put an archetype on the Demir deck that's floating around right now, but it continues to evolve and it hangs on, so it's here in C tier. And that's the basic standard tier list, at least to my mind, based on what data that we have from what few tournaments have taken place this season so far, and mostly from MTGO challenges and league results and such. These are the decks that tend to do the best the most often, and we can quibble over little things about it. Do you think Azoria Schooner is in S tier? I bet some of you don't. Do you think Golgari should actually be in S tier? Turns out a few websites think so. Do you think maybe Ramp or Human should be in the A tier? I imagine a few of you do. So again, we can get into little arguments in the comments section about that tier list if you want to, but I think it's actually more interesting to start listing out decks that maybe you know about right? But either haven't been putting up some of the results that we're used to from some of these other piles this season, or maybe haven't quite had the chance that they need to break out. And now with that, we've finally reached the thesis statement of the video. What are the best decks in Standard that aren't the best decks in Standard? Well, I want to start today with a deck that's sort of ironically been posting good results so far since Lost Caverns came out. Let's take a look at Dinosaurs to kick things off. Let's start by taking a look at what I believe is a fairly typical Dinosaurs deck in Standard right now, where the curve isn't too high, but it's also not too low. It's kind of like an aggro deck, but there are some rampy cards in there that help you get to those five drops ahead of schedule. This deck right here boasts a 73% win rate on Etherhub over not too many games, to be honest. As you can see, perhaps, a uh, normal win rate for a lot of these decks is around the 55% mark, which is where you really want to be, if not slightly higher than that. But anything above 50 50, 255 is a pretty decent place to be. Now, this deck has done really well again, not only at several standard challenges, but it is 5 0 several leagues as well, or decks like it at least. Dinosaurs of all the creature types from Ixalan have probably been doing the best so far in standard, and it's pretty easy to see why. Creatures like Belligerent Yearling have decent stats and a great keyword ability like Trample, and when you've got stuff, 
on curve, like, you know, three mana, six sixes, like Pugnacious Hammer Skull. Then cards like Belligerent Yearling can swing in for six trample on turn three pretty easily. And that's just kind of amazing. This deck also has ramp, but, you know, still decent stats on cards like Hulking Raptor, a four mana, five, three ward two, and you get two green mana every single turn. But you also have Rampaging Raptor. We've also got Bone Horde Dracosaur for a little bit of long game value. We can draw cards off of it. We can make bodies off of it. That's pretty sweet. So if the game does, does go a little bit longer than we want it to, or we don't get like the best start in the world, like Lore Keeper into Hammer Skull. Then we have things like Bone Horde Dracosaur, often come down on turn four, can help turn the game around does really well against certain aggro decks and of course flying first strike is just good so if they don't remove this <laughs> and there's a bunch of stuff they probably want to remove on the curve before this so if they remove like you know a ramp piece or belligerent uh, yearling and then they remove you know pugnacious hammer skull on the next turn hopefully you're exhausting the removal and they can't kill your bone horde and it just wins the game for you it skint is in here too the sort of bite spell on a body or fight spell on a body um, it is a bite spell, as a matter of fact, and so it doesn't surprise me there's four copies of this. A four mana or a two mana, two, three haste is already decent stats and keyword ability by itself, but when it becomes a removal spell, especially against other aggro decks and helps you get in while taking a thing off the board, maybe kill their brutal Cathar and get your haste dinosaur back and go on, like, there's some really good lines with its kent in the format. There's a lot of ways to build this deck right now, whether you do go, you know, full tilt crazy into the curve and start doing nasty stuff for six and seven mana, or you back it up on the curve and you don't play five drops like Bone Horde Dracosaur. You focus more on like the four drops with haste and such. So again, multiple builds and they have all done work in the early game here. All right, so here's the tier list and where, do, pray tell, do we start with dinosaurs? Um, I think that dinos are actually a pretty good little baseline. I'm looking at all the stuff that I want to kind of talk about in this video. As far as off meta decks, I will actually put them sort of in the A tier, but don't be surprised if they kind of back up in the A tier after a couple of entries here. Roar, but let's keep it pushing and look at other decks in this video. Can you imagine? Because it turns out there's like six more at least that I want to kind of take a look at and throw up on that tier list here. And the next one is one that I'm actually really excited is kind of a real deck in standard. Thanks again to some league data and some Intigio challenge data. We have a deck here next that's done really well in a couple of challenges recently continues to evolve and is kind of centered around the card that I just called the most fun card from LCI, at least in my mind. So let's take a look next at Azorius Smithy. All right, Smithy, Werbin, Jaegerman, Jensen. He was number one, so let's take a quick look at what this deck is trying to do. Okay, so obviously Thousand Moon Smithy is in here. We're only going to play three copies of it, at least in this sort of sample build from MTG Goldfish, but Goldfish says that this deck is about three to three and a half percent of the meta right now. Um, this particular list went six and two at a standard challenge, and it is five-owed multiple leagues, or at least different versions of the deck have five-owed multiple leagues so far this season. So, you know, it's got smaller creatures in it, like Market Gnome. It's not going to be doing any attacking, right? It's also got Thran Spider, which is a little bit of ramp. I actually really like this card of Three drop reach. That's a two four. And um, when it comes into play, everybody gets a Power Stone token, which is kind of nice. It's also got this ability you can pay seven mana to look at the top four and kind of impulse an artifact from those cards into your hand. Um, really, really sweet ability. But there's also a Cityscape Leveler in here, just a big like reset button for one permanent. You know, it's pretty sweet. Fabrication Foundry, really, really interesting card. This is the thing that you can either tap it to ramp artifacts into play. It's two mana. Or you can pay three, tap it, and exile one or more other artifacts with total mana value X to get an artifact from your graveyard with that mana value or less and put it into play. You can do this at sorcery speed only. Um, but there's a lot of interesting little tricks with this card, and you don't actually always see Fab Foundry in the Thousand Moon Smithy decks. So it's nice to have this little ramp sort of combo piece that lets you get your Smithy on turn three, among a bunch of other stuff. You know, we got Cityscape Leveler in the deck. Ramp is pretty good. spring Saw Sawblades, a card that I was pretty high on during previous season, ended up on my sleeper list and all that. You see it here in this deck as kind of removal, right? Glass Casket is removal. Iron Crag is ramp. All of these are artifacts. Braided Net is removal. Thousand Moon Smithy, Mightstone, Weeks. Stone is removal, right? So also important. Unstable Glyph Bridge is kind of a sweeper effect. Chimil the Inner Sun, Adakar Waste. So this deck goes the way of the sweeper. 
right? But it's able to sort of squeeze so many artifacts into it, right? 26 plus Market Gnome plus Thran Spiders plus Cityscape Leveler. How many actually is that? 26, 34, 34 artifacts in our artifact deck. So that is so many for, you know, Thousand Moon Smithy. Um, and it's interesting that you don't see, you know, Sunfall in the main deck or counter spells in the main deck because these Thousand Moon Smithy decks that rely on so much removal are often very control oriented. But this one, all in on the artifact theme while still being able to play all the sweepers and removal that it needs. Really, really interesting. I like it a lot. Now, Azo Rius Smithy, what are we going to do with old Morrissey here? I'm pretty sure Morrissey is definitely worse than Dinosaurs, as much as I love Thousand Moon Smithy, and just this deck in general and all the ways to build it, it's fun. Like Mono White Smithy is fun. There's even like an Orzhov Smithy deck that's kind of cool with like Blood Fountain and stuff, but that's beside the point. I'm pretty sure of all the decks we're going to look at today, probably a C-tier deck. But that doesn't mean it's bad, right? I don't think anything we're going to look at is going to be in the D tier. So let's keep that in mind. Can you imagine a planet with 1,000 moons? I think you might think that it would be really cool, but I'm pretty sure you max out at coolness at like 8 to 10 moons. And then after that, it just kind of becomes a nuisance. So let's go ahead and move on to the next deck that we want to look at today. And this is kind of another one that I'm really excited about. Um, I kind of may have said earlier something to the effect of like, these aren't the decks that I think are fun. These are actually the best decks according to data and blah, blah. Now, I also think that a lot of them are very fun. So let's take a look at Amalia next. So Molly, pretty decent deck right now, actually. There's versions of this that are kind of aristocracy. That uh, and I like to call this deck Amalia Kratz, uh, just a fun name, but one way or the other, there are aristocracy versions of this deck that are 5 0 ing MTGO leagues right now. But here we have a more life gainy version of it. This deck posting a 59% win rate over about 35 games over on Etherhub. And there's another version of the deck just underneath that entry that also posted a 58% win rate over about 40 games. So fairly consistent between all the different or the couple of different life game builds. And again, there are other builds of Amalia. Malia Benavides Aguirre, I was told to pronounce it that way, sorry I've been pronouncing it other ways, um, that have been doing again very well on MTGO this season, but the one we're looking at right now is more of a life gain -y kind of build. It's got Amalia in it right here, you see Amalia, the 2 drop 2-2, two, two, ward pay 3 life. Whenever you gain life, it explores, so either it gets bigger like in a Johnny's Pride Mate, or it draws a card whenever you gain life. These are both really good abilities. Of course, if it gets to... Uh, power 20 you can just blow everything else up but that's not going to happen too often it doesn't need to though like a two drop like six six that may have drawn you a card or two um that also has a ward ability you know pay three life these are all just really good things for only a two mana upfront investment so amalia very good turns out you have to play some life gain in your deck though but that's okay we've got some really strong life gain cards that don't just gain life like steel seraph is actually a really good turn three play after amalia you know Two, three right there on curve. Looks nice, but there's also Archangel of Wrath, Inspiring Overseer, so kind of an Angel's theme along with the Giada. Right, we are playing Giada in this deck. We're doing a couple of different things here. There's also a Splendid Angel, by the way, in this deck, which fits the life gain theme very well, <laughs> as well. Lunark Veteran, kind of a Soul Warden in here to help us get those life gain triggers. Virtue of Persistence, so we can get all of our you know important creatures back later on in the game or anything that we remove we can get back gix's command is just a very very strong card this is the much more sort of synergy driven pile that doesn't necessarily care about creature type it cares about other synergies and it's been kind of difficult to put those life gain or aristocracy synergies together and it's good to see the amalia deck really just amalia itself um pulling together all those sort of styles that we haven't seen in a good long time and giving them a place to live in standard give me amalia money let's see where you go this is the only one that doesn't have like a text on it or anything because it could be Amalia Kratz, it could be Amalia Life Gain, whatever, but both decks have kind of experienced a similar level of success this season, so I'm going to put this one right here. Let's snuggle it in between Dinos and Smithy right here in what I believe to be the B tier, although I'd really like to put her in A tier. I think B tier is more appropriate for Amy right now. Talk about some big gains, brother, you know what I'm saying? But let's move on because our next couple of decks are actually decks that you're probably pretty well acquainted with at this point, but you just haven't actually played against in a pretty long time, thankfully in some cases, because honestly, I feel a little bit wary 
uh, recommending this next deck to anybody because I really don't want to play against it anymore. But did you guys know that Toxic is really good right now? Dana, Dana, Toxic is a pretty sweet little deck. Honestly, I'm not going to spend too long looking at it because it's a deck that we all know and for the most part don't love, <laughs> right? But still, it's the venerated Rob Priest deck. This one in particular, I believe, is just Selesnia, but just recently, there was a uh, relatively well-attended tournament. It may have been Hollywood Pizza, but maybe I'm getting my lines crossed. It may have been the Big China tournament, where a Bant Toxic deck went like 11-1 and one or 10-2, and two, did really well, top 8 at all that, and we just hadn't seen Toxic in a long time. So that was an important result for this deck as well. But this has been, again, quietly doing work on MTGO in leagues especially, where you'll almost always see at least one Toxic deck, 5-0, every league result. So really interesting this deck is still hanging on in the way it is, and it's kind of in the background of Standard right now, but it's still very much a real deck. You know, not only is Venerated Rot Priest just a good card in and of itself, but Toxic has a bunch of good cards built around it. This deck actually has the nuts to play two Tyranax Rex in it that it doesn't necessarily even ramp into or anything. It's just if, if the game gets to the point where you can play Tyranax Rex, we can just win the game off of that. But we've also got a couple of Bloated Contaminator, some Skrelv in here, Crawling Chorus is the one drop, Annex Sentry is the removal spell, Slaughter Singer to help us get through, you know, more damage really. But it's also got Toxic 2, which is an awful lot of Toxic. Get Lost, it incorporates an important new removal spell for the deck. Skrelv's Hive, obviously, to keep bodies on the table. Tyvar stand. It targets our guys and also keeps around important guys like Rot Priest. Growing Rights, another interesting new card from LCI, but this one kind of even more so. <laughs> you know, this can grab an important creature and in some cases still play it if we have the mana left over. Like if it's Rot Priest, we have four mana, so that's cool. Um, and then when it transforms, we get a ton of mana. We can cast like Tyranax Rex more easily. So that's kind of neat. Not so much of a trickster build that's trying to not even attack for the poison counters or anything. This one's actually trying to do it honestly, and I respect that. Weird not to see Jawbone Duelist in the deck, but I'll still take it. Taste of your lips. I'm in the B tier, probably. Uh, Toxic's kind of tough. I actually kind of want to put Toxic in the A tier behind Dinos. Like, just a little bit. Like, Toxic's still a pretty good deck, you know? <laughs> like, I think that Toxic could easily win an event just out of nowhere at any point. But I think I would rather put it just ahead of Amy right here. As much as I love her, I think you're still B tier right now, but the top of B tier. So that's a pretty good place to be. Basically, if you haven't taken a drink from this deck in a while, come sip it up. It ain't bad. But we're going to move on here to another deck because, like I said... Wanted to look at a couple here in this little pocket of the video that are both decks we're, we've seen a few times before in the past and maybe have garnered a kind of a bad reputation for not being good enough over the last like year and a half and maybe nothing will truly make them good enough. But I have to continue to believe that Rakdos Anvil is still a deck and luckily it's giving us some results this season. Brandy Glanville. It's weird to see Oni Cold Anvil in like an off meta tier list video because for a long time not only has everyone known about this deck it's not like i'm telling you anything you don't already know right? this deck exists wow but you know i think that this deck has also been largely written off by most of the community at this point but i think that is a mistake given some of the new things the deck got obviously it plays only cold anvil not only did it get some cool new cards like blood letter of aklazots which means that you know they'll lose twice as much life to only cold anvil in any other you know, life loss triggers, which is kind of neat. But it also got O'Hare Axino, which is a really sweet card to use with Oni Cold Anvil. Basically, this is a four mana four four trample, and all that's cool and whatever. But basically, whenever a red source you control is going to deal any non combat damage that's less than O'Hare's power, i.e., one damage, for instance, instead it deals damage equal to O'Hare's power instead. So Every turn that we sacrifice something to only cold anvil, we're going to be dealing at least four damage from just anvil triggers. That is absolutely disgusting. <laughs> it's com completely gross. So this deck actually got a couple of new cards that are helping it do some real work. You know, it can get some kind of aggro. He starts with Godric. Blood Tithe Harvester is just still a really, really good two drop no matter which way you slice it. Everything in the deck works well with Blood Letter. Stoke the Flames is eight damage now. You know, Molten Collapse, a new, brand new removal spell that's doing work in the format. There's multiple ways to descend, obviously, in an only Cold Anvil deck. Mephitic Drought is off, or Draft is also in the deck. Um, draw card, lose a life, perfect, you know, only Cold Anvil target. Draws a lot of cards in this deck. 
Um, really, really sweet. Really, really sweet. Kimono faces Kakazan also for like the Godric starts to beseech the mirror to go get your blood letter or your O'Hare and just start going to town with your Oni Cold Amble. So really sort of well thought out deck construction. This one has a 59 win percentage over, um, well over a hundred games. It's like 140 games. So pretty decent sampling size to get a 60% win rate in the current format. Again, this deck has also done pretty well in MTGO League as up to now, um, with different numbers. Sometimes you'll see four O'Hare, sometimes you'll see no O'Hare and more Bloodletter, sometimes you'll see no Bloodletter. But, you know, some version of all these new cards will show up in the deck in some number or, or another. So, just a really cool deck that, again, can be built in multiple ways, and I think that counts for something. It's Anvil. Uh, that one's actually tough. I'm pretty sure Anvil is at the very bottom of C tier here. It's probably the worst deck we're going to look at today. But it's also, kind of ironically, like, the one with the most spread of, like, buildability. You know, there's, like, so much you can do <laughs> with the Anvil right now. A million ways to build it. And I'm pretty sure we're all just, like, still looking for the best build. So this one does have the sort of most potential and room to grow of almost any deck we're looking at. But sort of as a result of that, it's still got to be down here because we don't know the best build for Anvil or anything yet. Um, and maybe we'll figure it out and it'll move up a little bit. So we'll just say it's got room for improvement. It's in the bottom of C tier, but again, doesn't mean it's a bad deck. And remember that Anvil might only be good in this one tiny little window right now. So, you know, strike while the iron's hot. But next I want to talk about another Rakdos deck. Did you know there's actually like four playable Rakdos decks in the format right now? And there's some you might know about and some you might not. Like this next one, Rakdos... Ramp? That's right, Rakdos Ramp. This one actually got third place in a standard challenge just recently going 8-2, and two, but Rakdos Ramp has been pretty prevalent in the MTGO League scene and also in challenges. This deck is showing up in challenges left and right this season as well, and no one is talking about it, which is kind of surprising. It kind of replaced the Orzov Control deck from a season or so ago, the one that played Breach the Multiverse in the main deck as like the only black card. You guys remember that? Mono White would Breach the Multiverse. This deck, I feel like, is a spiritual successor to that deck. We play Breach the Multiverse as a two of, but we also play three Itali in this deck. So just once we do get the amount of mana that we need to get to, we've got these enormous plays that'll completely swing the game all at one time. But it's also Chandra in here, so a little bit of, you know, Rakdos mid-range action. This is a removal spell, a card draw spell, a ramp spell. It's all the things the deck wants and kind of bridges the gap between that, you know, six mana and seven mana up slot that you, like, you need to do because, you know, you can't count on drawing a land every time. So not only is there, there that, but there's also Archfiend of the Dross, the four mana 6-6 six, six flyer. Um, and whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, its controller loses two life. Pretty sweet little card right here. If you're going to play a four drop in black, you have an awful lot of options. So I'm always happy when people, you know, use those slots on Archfiend of the Dross of all things. You know, no Shieldred, no Bloodletter, no nothing. We'll go with Archfiend instead. It is a must kill threat, right? But in the meantime, we're also playing ramp like the Celestis, the Iron Crag, a couple of decent ramp cards. We've got a big score in here as well to really help ramp us at sort of instant speed. We can play a kind of control game in the stack, right? We've got Go for the Throat at instant speed, Sheldred's Edict at instant speed. We've got a sweeper in Brotherhood's End and a sweeper in Burn Down the House. Seven total sweepers in the deck. Plus all this ramp plus Virtue of Persistence is another seven drop that we can play that doubles as removal in the early game. So really interesting in terms of position right now, you know? I will say that Domain Ramp with the Traxa is probably the better ramp deck right now, but this deck plays much more the, the control role than that deck does. So it's nice to have that little bit of extra dimension against all the aggro decks in the format that would otherwise kill Atraxa before they can even get the Atraxa down. This deck has far more sweepers, even given that the domain deck plays, you know, four Sunfall or whatever. This deck has way more sweepers and way more just ancillary removal apart from its sweepers. So interesting little build here that we've actually seen doing, again, very quietly uh, well, especially in league results this season. But third place in a standard challenge is not bad either. Rack DOS control. R why rack Uno when you could rack DOS? Let's put this, I think, just ahead of Dinos. I think, in terms of like actual results, they're more or less neck and neck. Um, actually, I'll put it just behind Dinos. Let me do that. Let me put it just behind Dinos. My reasoning for that is because I think that there are more builds for Rakdos Ramp right now. And you could even make the argument, I think, that it's barely edged out dinosaurs in terms of, like, MTGO League 5.0 finishes and stuff. 
But that said, Dinos is a much more unique sort of fun deck that like no version of it really existed before LCI standard. And I want to give it some points for that. And again, it's just kind of the more sort of unique not honestly a little boring <laughs> sort of deck to look at so it just barely edges out but we got one more deck i want to look at and throw up on that stupid tier list thing try to get some views off that here we're going to look at what i think is easily the best of this entire pile of decks in this video that's why i saved it for last let's take a quick peek at simic glyph now in case you haven't seen the glyph deck yet let me give you a little zoe 101 here now zoetic glyph itself is a three mana aura of all things and enchants an artifact and that artifact is a five four golem in addition to its other types and whenever Zoe glyph is put into a graveyard from the battlefield discover three so first of all when it dies it can hit a copy of itself which is i think kind of neat but aside from that it can hit things like subterranean schooner obviously an incredibly important card in this format right now i really don't think the deck would work without schooner but we get to play a bunch of cards you don't see every day like not only glyph but the ozolith as a one of in here disruption protocol because there's plenty of artifacts we just get to play counterspell which is pretty sweet we get a single copy of soul cauldron to do fun tricks a spyglass siren to make an artifact on turn one and get attacking and crew the schooner pretty sweet ginger brood is in here also crews schooner also gets an artifact also gets attacking early great great card surge engine underplayed card in the current environment not only is this again an artifact that can crew schooner it can go unblocked and get bigger and draw cards really sweet card one of my favorite sort of jank cards underplayed cards in standard right now i love this thing it's also got teething wormlet in it if you're looking for more one drops that proc off artifacts and stuff tough cook you get to play tough cookie <laughs> in this deck and then like next turn you play zoetic glyph on the food token and you have a 2-2 and a 5-4 which is just Pretty gross. Kite Sail Larcenus is in here. Sometimes this will make a treasure out of one of your things. So that's kind of neat if you need another artifact or mana. But it's also a removal spell. Simic decks really need a spell like that. Sentinel of the Nameless City. Again, just good attacker that your opponent has to deal with. Might get bigger or draw you cards every turn. Might make maps for other things to get bigger. You know, you can explore with Ginger Brood off some of these things and like get bigger with Ginger Brood and get through. Surge Engine gets through with more plus one, plus one counters on it. Unblockable. Just really sweet little deck zoetic glyph is not the card in the deck but it is a pretty important component of the sauce here now simic glyph baby zoetic glyph and again there's multiple versions of glyph it doesn't have to be simic but glyph glyph right here bud glyph in the s tier not only again is this like one or five owed at least enough leagues for me to think that it is like a real deal deck at this point but you know just like Rakdos and dinos and anvil there's a bunch of ways to build this too and again i think that's a strength for a deck like this so we haven't found the right build and yet it's giving us like all these you know results and leagues and challenges and such so that's a good sign that you can almost build the deck however you want it's still going to do something some results for you not only is it fun and can you win games but it's also in some ways kind of a complex deck to sequence with and stuff and figure out what you what you want to use the glyph on and how you want to sequence your early turns to get the most out of schooner and there's kind of a lot of ins and outs to this deck too so fun um, winning and rewarding as well so give glyph a try and that is it ladies and gentlemen that is all the decks i wanted to talk about today but it's not i just want to be clear all the decks that we could have talked about right there's just for the sake of brevity i left a few out like the pna lar combo in naya that now has quintorius Khan and is putting up a little bit of results here and there uses ren's resolve and stuff like that draws a bunch of cards and then gets triggers off of both pia and quintorius really fun deck to play and actually put up some results especially right after wilds of eldraine came out so i wouldn't be surprised now that it has quintorius Khan if it's actually kind of an even more real deck so maybe you want to try that one out aside from that there's another Rakdos deck that's kind of making the rounds right now that's kind of a fair Rakdos discover is the best way I can describe it it uses discover cards like trumpeting carnosaur and geological appraiser and it ramps into them a little bit but actually not that much it's just kind of a fair mid-range deck that plays disgusting cards and actually wins games so there are some other decks out there if you want to look them up that are doing some fun stuff and there's even brand new decks like that Rakdos discover pile so there's a bunch of decks out there right now you know i didn't mention this yet but earlier back when i tier listed all the actual best decks in standard quote unquote actual best that was like 11 decks 
And then we talked about like seven decks just now and another two. So there's like 20 viable decks in standard that can win an event any day of the week right now. That sounds like a pretty decent standard, actually. Aside from that, just do the YouTube stuff. Like the video on your way out. You can hit subscribe if you haven't done that yet. I hear that there's a little firework celebration when you hit subscribe nowadays. So if you want to check that out, maybe... I think it does that. I don't know. Confirm it for me if you haven't done it yet. But aside from that, uh, what else is there? Twitch. You can check me out on Twitch. You can check out the Patreon. Just a dollar a month to vote on content. It's why I'm doing this video right now. If you'd rather seen something else, should be a patron. Just go <laughs> link in the description. It's just a buck a month. It'd be a really nice Christmas present for me if you could spare one dollar for the entertainment value, the EV that I'm bringing to you <laughs> this holiday season and every dang month of the year. But you know, if you don't have to scratch for that, that's fine. I'm just glad that you're here watching. Give me the views and the comments and all that. So get down there and let me know how you felt about all the stuff in this one. That is Itsky Lewitsky. I am Deb from The Blaze. Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love and be kind.